Hello, I'm here today at Kirchester's farm near Kelso. In this video, you will hear us discuss nitrogen fertiliser decisions, grazing management, the enterprise decisions in terms of beef enterprises, and the value of legumes, the value of clover. I'm joined here today by Paddy Jack of DLF Seeds and Tommy Clark of Kirchester's farm. Um, today we're talking all about grassland management, grazing management. It is April 2022 and fertiliser prices, ammonium nitrate prices are approaching £1,000 per tonne. So what can we do to make sure that those input costs don't eat too much into those valuable profit margins? So um, on to Tommy, could you introduce um, what you're doing here at Kirchester's farm please? Welcome, this is Kirchester's. It's a 360 hectare tenanted farm on Roxbury Estates. Uh, we're running currently about 120 suckler cows, which are Angus or Simmental crosses. We finish all the progeny. Currently it's bull beef. Uh, we're feeding barley and maximum untreated wheat to bulls. Finish them in about 14 months, aiming for around about 400 kilo carcass. And then we rebreed the heifers. Uh, probably about 20 heifers get rebred and the balance of them are finished. And they're somewhere in here, like way, way in the distance at the moment. Um, so that's the main focus. The, 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 we have about 25 hectares of permanent pasture on the farm and then we're rotationally about another 25 hectares in, in, in the arable rotation. And uh, we summer graze about 40 cows up on the Cheviot Hills and there's a sort of reciprocal agreement that the, some top lambs come back here to graze in the winter. Great, yeah. And so how are you finding, how are you adapting to these rising input prices? What sort of grazing um, adaptions are you putting in place? Yeah, well, it was actually some advice we got from you a couple of year ago, years ago, Poppy, really stimulated by the beef efficiency scheme that uh, we should really be looking into rotational grazing. And we've uh, started using a bit of fencing to, to paddock graze uh, some of the grass. Uh, and we're also doing a bit of strip grazing where it's not just quite as suitable uh, I, I think the the rising input prices is uh, it, it's frightening. It's we're looking at sort of three hundred percent increases in fertilizer and probably one hundred and fifty percent increases in cereals. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have a fairly radical rethink at the moment to yeah. to, to our future. And you mentioned um, the the bulls that you finish um, on ammonium treated barley. Are you changing anything in terms of your your cattle enterprises in the light of increasing costs? Yeah, it's. Interestingly, um, when these things start, uh, you know, start rising fast, I, I did some very rough figures, and at the moment, budgeting for farmers is really like sticking your finger in the air. But using the current prices and, and on, on the sort of system we are running, um, by the time I took most of the costs off, it was going to cost me about thirteen thousand to run this enterprise. So you think then we need need a rethink and. Uh, Quite interestingly, if we sort of half the cow numbers back to say 70 cows, maintaining the same area of grass, cutting our nitrogen fertiliser, currently we'll probably put about 180 kilos of nitrogen on our grass. If we cut that back to, to about 50 kilos of nitrogen, hopefully, using better use of clover, and take the cereals fed down from maybe 180 tonnes down to 30 tonnes, uh, so with 70 cows, we'd be finishing about 60 cattle. And I can see ourselves leave a, leaving a, a margin of about 13,000 then. So, yeah, Taking certainly worth it. a good hard look and made some big changes. Yeah, that, that would be the, the future. So the idea is this autumn will probably cull out 40 or 50 cows and uh, aim to carve a lot less. Maintain the area of grass, but just use a much lower Take input low system. Cost. Great, thank you. Now, Paddy, you're travelling a lot from farm to farm. Um, what are you sort of seeing in terms of nitrogen fertiliser use decisions and, and what are you feeling in terms of whether these decisions are right or wrong? Yeah, surely, Poppy, a lot of people are, are just exactly the same as Tommy. They're facing this unbelievable change in, in what they have to do to adapt. And in grazing situations, most farmers are deciding to let clover be much more of a friend than it has been in the past. 
However, clover doesn't do what we want the grass to do in March and April. So nitrogenous fertilizer will almost definitely stay at a decent level on the first application. The March level, whether it's a urea uh, or, or an ammonium nitrate slightly later in the season, because clovers won't fix uh, any nitrogen for the companion crops till the soil temperatures maybe 12 to 14 degrees. But then clover through the drier months into May, June, July, August is really quite capable of keeping ryegrasses and ryegrasses and timothies growing at a level to sustain, uh, you know, the, the ton an acre of, of, life, uh, of livestock uh, on them or 2,500 kilograms to the hectare uh, have to modernise. So that's a grazing situation, nitrogenous fertilizer early on, perhaps a little mid-summer if we face a July drop. So people will try and force the ryegrasses on then. But in a silage situation, Poppy, undoubtedly large cutbacks in application are not as easy to do. Grasses will not respond to uh, a reduction in that same level in silage situation as they do in grazing. But then we have to look at other species and perhaps the utilisation of red clover, um, a species we haven't used as much in, in Scotland as we should have done. Um, but red clover is quite capable of giving us 12, 14 tonnes of dry matter a hectare and therefore maintaining silage yields at a, at, at a, at a decent level. And of course, with the side effect of having a good protein content. The downside for them is they don't like wet, heavy clays. They like free draining soils with a very good pH um, and they only really last about three years. Yeah. So you're talking about um, the persistency of some of these species. So in terms of species mix, what would you be advising for long term mixes that are going to last um, into the to seven year mark? Type? Yeah, the seven year uh, mixture um, is, is probably five to seven year is still probably a backbone of a lot of Scottish systems. Not so much here in the good lands of the East Coast where Tommy's lucky to farm. Um, but when we go into longer term, we still have to look at perennial ryegrasses, um, largely intermediates and lates, very little early sold now in Scotland and um, the intermediates grow early enough to give us the bite and of course white clover. Um, uh, soils that are perhaps uh, higher in clay fraction or even in peat and anything that is um, uh, higher rainfall or above maybe 400 feet above sea level really needs to have a, a content of timothy as well. Um, a species that grows nice and early, uh, in fact grows through the winter um, uh, and uh, gives us that lovely bite for, for sheep that are running on, on hill ground or upland ground through the winter time and gets going early. So perennial ryegrass will probably be, still be 85 to 88% to of most mixtures for five to seven years. The festiloliums, the meadow fescues, the red clovers, all these things tend to be much smaller in demand and for specialist use poppy. Yeah. So you've got on your hand there some uh, plantain and some chicory. So we're in a, we've got some plantain and chicory in the sward here. Yeah. Um, yeah. What would you say about the sort of value of these type of herbs in the sward and the persistency of these herbs? Yeah, indeed. Uh, they're, they're really useful additions, particularly in grazing swards. Uh, Tommy cut this uh, last year once, I think, and the analysis has been very good. But in general, herbs like um, plantains and chicories really are for grazing. Um, uh, and any, any plant will try and support a seed head. That's what nature makes them do, whether it's a perennial ryegrass or a clover or a plantain or a chicory. They try and do what nature wants, which is to run to a seed head. And we have to manage that out of the plants. That's more difficult with, with chicories and plantains. Uh, they, they get, uh, their, their fibre becomes more lignous quicker than perennial ryegrasses. So sometimes in silage cuts, they can be quite fibrous, quite twig-like, and therefore the digestibility is less. In a grazing situation though, um, these, these herbs really root very deeply. So they, they can extract nutrient and moisture from deeper in the soils, but also they contribute greatly, particularly to midsummer grazing, because they aren't affected by drought and they have good high levels of energy and protein content. As far as persistency, if you sowed them in 2022 poppy, this is year zero, uh, they would last for 2022, 2023, 2024. We would then start to see the numbers reducing quite markedly after that. Um, so there's a drop off after year one and then there's a substantial drop off as we go into year three. Um, there's many, many more of them used in grazing mixtures. As far as percentage is concerned, I tend to put in maybe um, 
4% chicory and maybe 3 or 4% ribwort plantain. But the biggest herb of the lot is white clover. Uh, and I think it should be included at 5 or 6%. We know what it does. White clover on its own maybe yields 2.4 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. Ryegrass is 12 to 14, but you put the two together and you get about eight or nine or maybe even 10 and without nitrogenous fertiliser. And that's, that's what we're trying to do in uh, agriculture in Scotland as we go forward. Great, thank you. So we're standing in a field um, with the, the grazing heifers at the moment and the cattle have been out, what, less than a week now, is it? Yeah, just a, just really a couple of days. I, I think they ought to have been in probably a week quicker. But um, uh, the, the cattle fit round the arable, and we had uh, yeah, we well, were busy fertilising, and uh, yeah. we we're also calving, so they they were uh, yeah last on the list. And we probably should have had them, or could have had them out quicker. But I've got about ten bales of silage left, so I was reasonably relaxed. Very good, thank you. Um, so there's plenty of grass in this field um, and so going forward we've talked a lot about clover and encouraging clover in this ward. We've talked about the, the value of these herbs in terms of silage. Um, so in terms of managing this field going forward what are your ideas to, to make to encourage that clover through um, and also um, get a good silage cut as you intend later on in the year? Yeah I, I think in, in crude terms we well, not in crude terms, we, we, we graze 40 cows up on the hills. And uh, my idea is that we have everything eaten round about up until first cut time. So our first cut, in effect, is all grazed. And then we can shove animals together, close up fields, and, and that releases ground to, to silage. This is a nice field to silage. It's fairly level and it's fairly near the steading, so it, it suits itself. And we also have a slatted cattle court so the slurry to go on so if we can get this grazed nice and hard so we'll put more mouths in here uh, we've split it's a 10 hectare field and it's split in two mm -hmm. so we'll we'll graze one half hard and then they'll flip to the other half and then hopefully it'll be yeah almost like a silage moor has been in here the rye grasses should head out third week in may here so we, we, we need to have it nicely eaten down in what's that, about five weeks time yeah would be my target. Great. We, we do have perennial ryegrasses now uh, in Scotland on the SAC recommended list that are really, really late. Um, some of the newer ones um, are actually up to seven days later than we've ever had before. Uh, one of them, in fact, now doesn't form a seed head until uh, the 2nd of July. So uh, by using a greater proportion of late perennial ryegrasses, whether tetraploid or diploid, along with intermediates, we can actually keep the quality much later in the calendar year than we did before. Good to know, thank you. Um, and then obviously you've got a lot of spring grass coming through. Uh, was there anything you did differently in the, the winter in terms of closing up the fields or um, to make sure it's got, this, got a long rest period so you've got the spring grass production? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. To be honest, Poppy, we, we, or I, I, in my career, I think the seasons have shifted. I think we're getting more open autumns, and we're getting later springs. So we are we're eating grass down reasonably hard. This had heifers in, I think, until the beginning of November. Um, our cows, we didn't have our cows in till the beginning of December. So we have a moderate area of eeks grass margins. So any field that's stubble. There's usually a hectare or half a hectare of grass around it. So we just eat our way around there and try and keep the cows out as long as possible. And as the young stock hopefully in by the round about the beginning of November. Um, and then it's got a little bit of urea fertilizer probably about a month ago just to get, get it started. And uh, you know, th this April has been much growthier than last April. So our, our spring has started quicker and better than a year before. The oil seed rapes are much further on and much bigger than they were a year ago or two years ago. We'd, just saying two years ago, oh, April 20, we had zero rainfall, which is the only month I've ever seen with nothing. Whereas this year we've, we're an inch so far in April and it's, yeah, I can see this really coming on now. Yeah, we're making the most of a good season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you've heard Paddy talk about the importance of clover. It's very important to get the grazing heights right, particularly at this time of year, to encourage that clover to come through and encourage the tillering of the ryegrass. So this is where target grazing heights for entry and exit of a field are important. So for those that are rotationally grazing, they want to enter a field at around the 8 to 10 centimetres marks. 
about a Coke can stood on end. You want to exit the field around four to five centimetre mark, about a Coke can laid flat. We do this because it encourages sunlight to the base of the sward, which encourages clover. It gives it that advantage over the ryegrass, particularly at the start of the season when soil temperatures are lower. It's also important to maintain the quality of the pasture, particularly later on in the year where quality starts to reduce generally. If we can maintain these grazing heights, then that quality can be maintained to keep those cattle growing. And then in addition, it favours the more palatable species in that sward. So keeping the grazing heights um, and favours the ryegrass, the good ryegrass favours that quality um, so that these species last in the sward for longer. So I'd encourage you to use the, the grazing height um, to understand whether you've got your management right. So you can see in this field the grass is quite high, it's above the coke can height. So I'd encourage Tommy to be putting more mouths in this field to try and graze it down a bit tighter to maintain quality later on. If the um, opposite was true, if it wasn't quite reaching the coke can height, I would be looking at trying to either reduce the miles in the field or increase a rest period for those rotationally grazing in order to, to get it on target. So rest is really valuable, um, particularly for, for ryegrass. Um, if you consider how selective animals are in a field, they will always graze out the sweeties. They'll always graze out the most palatable grasses. So under a sex sort of situation, you're actually disadvantaging those palatal grasses. So by resting it, using means such as rotational grazing, enables those, those grasses to continue growing. And then when they come back to a paddock, they, they're coming in to a consistent paddock of all those, the ryegrass and clover, rather than those less palatable weed species coming through. We're very good in Scotland at growing grass. But any means that we can do to improve the utilisation of what we grow can improve the cost effectiveness of our beef or sheep systems. Using rotational grazing, you increase the amount of grass that goes down the animal's throats to produce meat, milk and wool. So less of it is wasted. So we're in a time where um, input costs are increasing, but we've got a great opportunity to make more of what we grow for a minimal extra cost. I hope you found this video useful. I just want to say thank you to Paddy Jack and thank you to Tommy Clark for um, participating in this video and using this site. If you'd like further information, I suggest you go to the FAS website and look for planning for high fertilizer prices in a beef system. It's a FAS fact sheet. Thank you.